Hello? Hi guys. So uh, today I'm going to be talking about contract patterns and security. Uh, I'm Anthony Fenway, CTO of the East Global. Hi. Hello? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm the CTO of the East Global. And um, I um, am famous for basically doing the first ever Ethereum transaction on block uh, number 46147. And I'm here going to uh, talk about contract patterns and security. So, um, so the key points is first, Slinky is not broken. Okay, so a lot of people. Um, there's some um, posts in the past saying that Solidity, because it is a, uh, an impaired language, that um, it's a poor choice for writing uh, contracts that um, has like state transitions. So I'm going to show you guys that um, just with proper tooling and architecture, we can actually write secure and easy to manage contracts. Um, so we're going to use, uh, I'm going to show you guys code patterns that allow us to minimize attack surface. And I'm going to show you guys the, the contract execution flow and figure out um, how you guys can identify attack surfaces in your contracts. And also, I'm going to uh, show you the case study of the uh, digit score contract architecture. Right, so, both. Uh, So the um, code planes. Code, um, good software design requires, um, basically gives us secure, uh, good security. So if you write, uh, if you have good architecture, you'll be able to actually create um, easy to secure and easy to audit code. Um, first point is that good uh, readable code and, and good architecture, which is um, that can easily be reasoned to, can, can be read by an external auditor. So if you send your code, your code base to a third party um, auditing company, they can actually easily read your code without having to deal with spaghetti code. Right? So um, we know that if, if like, this type of code, well, if you send this to somebody, it's going to take a while for them to parse through this. And that makes um, auditors' lives so much harder. And um, two, like good software architecture will also allow us to actually have reusable battle tested code. So basically we can we can take um, components and build them out individually and we can reuse those um, those components for other parts of our contracts. And since we know that these are battle tested and the security, we know that the security is good. So um, good um, software architecture also allows us to have separation concerns, which um, actually enables the second point as well. So if you separate your, your code logic into separate um, contracts, uh, in the case of Ethereum, then it's easier for you to audit it. And it's also easier for you to control the attack surface, the potential attack surfaces on your contracts. All right, so I, I, I'm sort of, uh, want to make the analogy of an electronic circuit versus um, software. So in um, like an electronic hardware, for example, uh, a computer motherboard or a CPU, um, once that's created and, and fabricated, um, it's, it's very difficult for the manufacturer to recall those products. So basically, in essence, like Ethereum contracts, uh, when you deploy them to the, to the blockchain, you can never change them. So, um, so in, in essence, like, we, we're expected to, to become electronics engineers when you write contracts in Ethereum, right? So here we have a Commodore 64 motherboard. I don't know if maybe you guys are familiar with this old school um, computer motherboard. We have um, a series of um, memory chips and the you know, MOS sound chip, uh, the interfaces. So when you design uh, hardware, you have different components that are known. Uh, know to work well and, and, and they've been tested and you just basically put these things together and you have you know a device. So basically that, that sort of falls into the same concept as um, a software development paradigm called 
designed by contract. And, and I'm not talking about absolutely contracts here, but um, basically creating your, your, your software based on small components that multiple people can work on or multiple organizations can work on. And you have uh, basically a set of conditions that you can take in and, and that will you know, either produce a side effect or an output value. Very simple, right? So basically, if you can make an analogy, this is sort of like your sound chip or your CPU. You can put input in it and you have the expected output from it. I think battery of this is dead. They're dying. Do you guys have another controller? It's not working. Sorry about that. Sorry about difficulties. Thank you. Alright, so um, the third point is um, Separation of concerns, you basically separate um, your contrast into small pieces that can uh, be easily audited and uh, you basically can define the entry points and exit points to your contracts. Um, and number four, um, good architecture will uh, allow us to actually um, write um, better tools um, such as static analysis um, tools and generators to create, um, basically help you create boilerplate code to implement this, um, uh, this approach. So, so what are attack vectors? All right, so attack vectors are basically uh, code paths that allow a malicious user, such as a hacker or somebody, um, a user that sends unintentional, unintentional code to your software that, that um, either gives them unauthorized access um, and these can, um, in, in traditional um, software, we, we have command line arguments where you can pass, um, uh, you can pass like some, some uh, a hacker can pass a uh, carefully crafted, uh, carefully crafted code um, such as um, a shell code with, with some buffer overflow exploits and basically give them access to that machine. Um, environment variables as well, and URL parameters, which is uh, common in web application hacking, where you can basically have a hacker send uh, SQL injection commands into your application uh, by basically sending a carefully crafted post data or URL parameter. And also data storage, which falls in the same uh, concept as the, uh, the, the previous post of uh, URL parameters. Um, in this case, somebody has access to the database and your application uh, reads um, some data from that data and, and causes your uh, application to behave in a way that we're not expecting to. And in the case of uh, Solidity and, and Ethereum contracts, these are function parameters and third-party contracts that can um, access your contracts. So let's look at the um, Ethereum transaction flow. So we know that um, all Ethereum transactions must happen from an externally owned account. That means your private key. Um, so in the first um, four examples, we have an externally owned account calling an Ethereum contract. And, and that can um, go with um, an Ethereum contract paste out to another externally owned account. And the third example is um, an externally owned account that sends a uh, transaction to an Ethereum contract. And that also calls another Ethereum contract. And that is um, basically where you see things such as uh, recursion and uh, reactancy problems, right? Uh, so, and then the third, act, um, the fourth one is just basically somebody sending ether to another externally owned account. And the last two uh, can't happen, right? Because like contracts cannot basically start their own execution. 
maybe in the future. So let's look at the uh, example ERC20 token. Here, this is uh, actually on the that bin, I just cut and pasted this. And this is basically the, uh, the, to the standard token format, um, standard token code with the uh, standard interface for it. So here we have um, the contract, and then you have send coin function, which takes the values, coin balance, which um, shows you like the balance of the, the uh, account from, um, from the mapping. And you have balance off and approve. So I have all these functions, and, and they are all reside in the same contract, right? So it's, same, it's in the same binary that once deployed on the blockchain, it's immutable. You can't change it, and it's very difficult to have people point to a different contract address. So what, what we're going to do is we're going to break down the, the contracts into. Um, pieces. Um, basically, these are components that, that behave in a certain way and, and you can basically describe your, your software just based on these contracts. So we have interface, controller, storage, and the last two are basically what um, uh, glues everything together. Uh, we have the access control and the directory services and resolver. So interface contracts. Contracts have been called directly by an end user for external contracts. This is the main entry point, right? So basically, this is the contract that when you compile it and you produce the uh, JSON ABI, this is the the, con uh, the the ABI that you put onto your Mystic wallet or you give to your uh, users or to uh, other people that will be using your contracts. Um, so this is the main entry point. So for our design, this is the only attack surface. So this simplifies a lot of the security audits and, and, and making sure that your code is secure. This, this is the only entry point. And we can control this a lot better than having a file that has all the logic in one file and then this can get overwhelming when you read it. Right? So if you're dealing with, with 400 lines of code or 500 or 1,000, it's overwhelming to read one file and you can't really uh, you know, it's, it's hard to reason about like large pieces of information. So if you break it down to smaller pieces, it's a lot easier to reason about it and figure out what's going on. Am I just having the worst luck for this? So, interface contracts, talk about it. Um, control contracts, basically this is where most of the code logic goes, and this is where you basically have um, your, your uh, the, the interface contracts calls this, basically, and, and all the functions that are, are needed to be called um, that, that basically either change storage state, uh, state storage, or does some calculations are all in here. So most of your logic is going to be here, and if you want to look for logic errors, this is where you would look for, right? Storage contracts. Right, this is basically your database, right? So in, in um, traditional MVC, this is your model. This is where you put all your data, and you put um, basically this is where all the information is um, about your contract and the state of your your DAP. Other components, access control. This is actually a very important piece. It actually puts everything up. Uh, basically, this is the, the biggest piece that um, puts everything together. And this basically sets the re reusable code that we can use to describe how a resource can be accessed. And at Digits, we sort of identified several access control patterns. Um, basically, these are how, how you describe how a resource can be accessed by an external loan account or another contract. And so that would be an example here is like the AC owned contract that we have and it's very straightforward. There's a, a contract that has an owner and if the sender of that, um, that transaction is the owner, they let it through. If not, then you throw an error and eat up every, um, the gas that they sent. 
right? And then here we have the, it's very small, uh, the groups. So basically this is the same as the owner, but you can basically define multiple users to, to use, uh, to basically say that like this, uh, this, uh, this resource can be accessed by these addresses. And it's basically a simple mapping that says, um, if, you're, if you're in a group, uh, you're, you can access it. And then there's like some functions to add and register users or add groups in the system. And the directory service. This is um, what puts everything together. It's basically a key value store. It's its own contract storage. And it tells um, the other contracts, um, not, because now we have split the contracts into multiple pieces, then you have um, a directory service that tells you basically where those contracts reside. So in our directory service, it's pretty straightforward. It's just a mapping of um, some byte string and the address. And we can uh, resolve it, we can register and get the values. Right? And we have, um, if you can look at this uh, second function here, or first function, I guess, uh, if group NS address, they allow you to uh, do that, uh, call that function. And then we have a resolver client. Here, which is basically a um, this is your your name server um, resolution uh, client it allows you to figure out where the contract um, what what the contract you need to call is and if um, there's also a modifier check basically to say that if if I'm being called by this contract based on its byte address or there's what this byte string then allow me to go and, and do what I want to do right so. Sorry. So, directory service. Oh, here's the resolver. So, here's the, 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 the meat of this, this whole talk, really, is the ICS pattern at Digix. So, here we have um, the TX origin. This is the entry point. This is your attack surface. And this is where you would look at where um, a malicious person would, would attack your, your application, right? So you have group access control, and you have um, you have your uh, in Digix we have like different interfaces for different roles on the system, and uh, the directory service bus tells those contracts where to go next, and um, you have the storage at the bottom. So the storage basically, uh, if you look at this this design, you can basically easily change contracts and update them and add new functionality or fix a bug um, by just actually changing the, the, the value on the resolver. Um, so the only thing that's really difficult to change are the, the, the storage uh, contracts because that's where all your state, the previous state is on there. So if you have a token contract and you have your ledger information on there, then that's kind of difficult to change. But there's ways. Anthony, do you have any information for where people can find more information? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so this is basically a call to action for people to, to contribute more to like these ideas. Um, so you can reach me at last. Yeah. Yeah, that's my contact information. Um, Slack, Reddit, Twitter. Take a screenshot. Awesome. Thank you very much.